going to ask you to remain standing this morning. I'm going to read our text this morning out of the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. I'm going to begin in verse 15, reading from the Passion Translation. He will be one of the great ones. You know, you're standing by one of the great ones. Go ahead and look at him. You act like you're afraid to look at him. And he will be one of the great ones in the sight of God, and he will drink no wine or strong drink, but he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even while still in his mother's womb. And he will persuade many in Israel to convert and turn back to the Lord their God. He will go before the Lord as a forerunner with the same spirit, or excuse me, same power and anointing as Elijah the prophet. He will be instrumental in turning the hearts of the fathers in tenderness back to their children and the hearts of the disobedient back to the wisdom of their righteous fathers. He will prepare a united people who will be ready for the Lord's appearing. And just go ahead and turn on, just go to verse 76, same chapter, verse 76. And to you I prophesy. I love this because this is Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist. He said, and to you I prophesy, my little son. You will be known as a prophet of the glorious God. For you will be a forerunner going before the face of the master, Yahweh. I want to speak for a few moments this morning on the subject of forerunners. There is a forerunner anointing on this house. You, ma'am, you, sir, have on you the anointing of a forerunner in Jesus' name. Do you receive it? You can be seated in the presence of the Lord today. You know, as I had the privilege to speak in at Revival Weekend, thank you so much, guys. As I had the privilege of speaking the Friday night of the last Revival Weekend, the Lord really began uh, to press into my spirit about us being rain runners. I spoke out of the First Kings chapter 18, and where we all, it's a very familiar story where Elijah prayed rain out of heaven, and it was a heavy rain. And the Bible says that the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah. He girded up himself. And he ran in the heavy rain. Beating Ahab in his chariot to the city. On that night, I asked, were there any rain runners in the building? I'm going to work on that just a little bit, but I'm going somewhere. So those that were here don't, don't get disheartened. I'm going to, I'm going to go somewhere with it. But I, I need to, to revisit 1 Kings chapter 18. Uh, I just felt I couldn't get away from it all week long. I kept going back to it and kept going back to it. And I said, Lord, I don't, I don't really see. I think I pretty much did everything I'm supposed to do there. And, and then I, in my Bible reading, I was just reading in Luke chapter 1, just going through my Bible reading this week. And, and then when I got to this verse 17, then it said he, talking about John the Baptist, he will go before the Lord as a forerunner with the same power and anointing as Elijah the prophet. As Elijah the prophet. And so the Lord began to take me back there uh, to Ezekiel, or 1 Kings uh, chapter 18. And I want to revisit it real quickly and, and, and then move on from there and maybe even move into some other things next week. But I really feel very strong that not only was Elijah a, a rain runner, he was a forerunner. He was a forerunner. When you, when you, when you uh, study Elijah, you realize that he just basically showed up one day. He showed up one day and began to give a prophetic word to King Ahab. And the word was... The God is sending the famine, and for three and a half years, it's not going to rain. I'm going to pray, and it's not going to rain because God told me to. 
And then he showed up three and a half years later. And he said, I'm getting ready to pray, and it's going to rain because the Lord told me to. For three and a half years, Israel now has been in a drought. They've been in a drought so long that they became used to living in an atmosphere with no rain. When I saw that, I realized that much of the church today has become used to living in an atmosphere with no rain. And so when I began to study the text, I began to realize that Israel itself was a, a, a type of the corporate church, the church at large, the universal church. And Ahab was a church, a individual church, and then Elijah was an individual church. So what I saw in the story here is that you have the people of God, and then you have two types of worship experience. Uh, you have two types of church. You have the Ahab church and the Elijah church. And so when God raised Elijah up, God raised him up for confrontation. And what we see here in, in, in 1 Kings 18 is what I want to begin by calling a supernatural showdown. A supernatural showdown. Because I really believe that we're moving into a time where there's going to be a supernatural showdown. Because I believe the Ahab church is alive in our nation and I believe the Elijah church is emerging. It may even still be in somewhat hidden in obscurity like Elijah was hidden in obscurity. But when God's time came for Elijah to rise in power and anointing, he rose. And when he rose up, Elijah was brought out of this obscurity. But he did not confront necessarily Ahab as much as he was confronting the spiritual condition of Israel. He was, conf he he was uh, confronting the church at large, what kind of atmosphere of worship and experience do they have going on? You see, when you, when you study this, you realize that Israel had dived headlong into idolatry, into idolatry, uh, into idolatry uh, Baal worship, Asherah worship, had overtaken all the places of worship. Any altars that had been built to worship Yahweh had been broken down. Uh, the temples in the land had been filled up with Baal worship and Asherah worship. They had taken on another kind of experience. Uh, and so what we see here then is we see that Elijah comes to confront them. Uh, you know, idolatry is simply us looking for other things and other, uh, other places to fulfill our significance. Idolatry is when we're looking for other things other than God. You see, uh, John Calvin said man's nature is a perpetual factory of idols. In other words, what he's saying is the human heart is the factory of idols. It's constantly producing idols. You kill one idol, it'll produce another idol. It is the very nature of man to worship something. When he does not have this incredible relationship with God, this up-to-date, real, authentic relationship with God, he will always seek to worship other things. See, it, 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 idolatry is when good things become ultimate things. God is the ultimate of the ultimate. But when I allow things that are good, not necessarily things that are evil, but I, when I allow good things to become the ultimate thing in my life, it now has moved me into a place of idolatry. And when you, when you study out the, the, the worship of Baal and Astra, because I'm getting ready to work on bang something up pretty good here, is that, that we understand the ancient Baal worship and the modern Baal worship uh, may look somewhat different, but it is built on the same two pillars. It is built on pillars of seduction. It is built on pillars to pull people away, the people of God away. See, Israel were the people of God, the chosen people of God. They had history. They had a relationship with Yahweh. But Ahab had opened up the land. Ahab, through his own ingenuity and ideas and systems, with Jezebel had brought in another kind of worship. And it was the worship that pleased the flesh of man. It was the worship that was full of corruption, that was full of, 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 of compromise and full of carnality. And they brought this in to the land. And matter of fact, when, when uh, Elijah showed up, uh, Ahab didn't even understand why he was there because Ahab didn't even understand the depth 
of their idolatry, of their sinfulness. He didn't even understand what was going on. He thought it was a trivial thing, what was going on in the land. But man, it wasn't trivial to God at all. And God had all he could stand of it. And he began to raise up Elijah. He brought him out of obscurity. I believe that there are many Elijah type churches today who are prophetic and apostolic, who are in the obscure places. But God's tired of this Ahab church being the church of the land and he's getting ready to raise up an Elijah church but the purpose of this Elijah church is to confront to confront the idolatry that's in the church today and when you study Baal worship and, and astral worship it basically had two pillars to it it was success and sexuality. I might get quiet in here for a minute. Baal was the male, Astro was the female. They were gods of fertility. Success and sexuality. This was a big deal. It's a big deal. You see, sometimes when we talk about idolatry in the Bible and we talk about Baal worship and we talk about they had their poles and their, and, and their statues, we think they're just kind of running around bowing down and, and, and dancing around these things. But what we have to understand, this, this no, 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 this, this, this was a vile thing. This is a big deal. Just as, as Elijah had called Israel as a people, he called all of Israel to Mount Carmel. They were used to this because Baal and Asherah worship would call all the people. It wasn't just a select few and, and a few places they would go and do a little homage to, a, to, to some idol. No, 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 no. They would gather corporately. They would gather corporately and they would come together. And, and the, the fake prophets, the fake prophets of Baal and the fake prophets of Asra, 450 prophets of Baal, 400 to Asra. They're, they're, they're different prophets for different purposes because they taught different things. They would gather the people of God together and they would tell them the latest ideas. This is a modern flip on it, if you would just allow me to do this. And they would tell all the people, this is how you grow your best bumper crop. This is how you get the crop that you need. This is how you get prosperity. This is how you get all these good things in your life, is you worship Baal, is you give yourself to Baal. And they would come up with all the gimmicks and all the ideas, and they would come together, and, and, and they would worship this God, Baal. And they would listen, and they would soak in to what the fake prophets were beginning to release over them and, and, and begin to promote uh, uh, their ideas of how they could be successful and how they could prosper and how they could live a great life and how everything was about them having everything they've ever wanted and ever needed. And they, and they, they fed this thing that's in everyone that wants to succeed. I'm going to preach this thing because, you see, it's deeper than we realize. It's deeper than we realize. And so he began to preach these fake prophets, and then they would, then they would begin to dance around the Asherah pole. And, but it wasn't just them dancing. It was about a sexual experience. It, it, it was about they would come, and they would gather around, and they would watch, and they would watch the sensuality, and they would watch all the sexuality, and they would even begin to participate in what was going on. See, I'm telling you, it's a big deal. And we act like it's no big deal anymore. We act like it does, but we got to understand something. This spirit of sexuality, uh, immoral sexuality, and this spirit of success has got the body of Christ all messed up. We got our priorities in the wrong place, and we don't realize it that much of the church today is worshiping idols and walking in every Sunday morning. They're not worshiping God. They have. They don't care if glory comes. All they want to know is when I leave here, well, I have what I need to be successful. But you know what the greatest cost of this, of them beginning to feed on this, because obviously this became their whole lifestyle. You know what the greatest cost is? The children. I 
I knew it'd get tight. I come ready. That's right. There, there, there were some that would bring their children and sacrifice them on the altar of success and the altar of sexuality. They would offer up their children as sacrifices. Have we not offered up our children as a nation? The ultimate price is the life of unwanted children. 55 million plus children butchered in our nation since 1973 on the law, on the altar of convenience, on the altar of success, on the altar of sexuality. We, we have chosen convenience and perversion over legacy and over destiny. I want you to know that this worship, this idolatry gets down deep in the side of a nation. Israel didn't know what to do with it. Uh, they, 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 they were conflicted. They were conflicted. And that's why Elijah shows up and he says, today you're going to make a choice. Today you've got to decide. Today you've got to make up your mind who you're going to follow. I'm going somewhere. God, help me do this. He said, you've got to make up your mind. See, the believers of Yahweh were conflicted. They had enough history with Yahweh not to agree with everything that the Ahab church was doing and that the Ahab church was propagating, but they were conflicted. They didn't know how to walk away. It was too hard to walk away. How can I walk away from the success? How can I walk away from this, this, this thing? that feeds my flesh and that allows me to live in immorality without question. How can I walk away from this? Because you know, they really wanted to be socially accepted. How can we create an atmosphere? How can we create how we preach and what we teach in a way that it is socially accepted? To speak about abortion and sexual immorality, my friend, most churches won't touch with a 10-foot pole because they're wanting to be socially accepted. They were worried about being socially awkward. But I want you to know God said, that's fine with me. I'll raise me up a people. He sent Elijah to speak to them and call them out. It was a showdown. And he said, today you're going to make a choice. Today the duplicity is going to end. Who are you going to follow? You see, when you go deep in this, to stop going to the party. To lose my respectability and my toleration. Which ultimately leads to participation. Who are you gonna follow? Because see, anyone that questions that worship experience ends up on the wrong side of the public opinion. <laughs> what Ahab called Elijah was, oh, you're the troubler. You're the one causing all the trouble. You're the one causing all the trouble. Abraham. I don't know why I keep getting Abraham on my mind. It's just like the devil putting Abraham on my mind. Elijah. Don't worry, I was just having a conversation with myself. 
Let's say that's okay. <laughs> Is that okay? <laughs> I know you're there. <laughs> He said, you're the troubler. Elijah shot back. He said, no, sir. You're the troubler of Israel. You and your fathers opening up this land to be desecrated by Jezebel and, the, and all the, the prophets of Baal. He said, you are the troubler. So we know, we know, we know what, what happened is Elijah simply called Israel. He said, call all of Israel to Mount Carmel. Gather the prophets of Baal. He said, we're going to do the altar thing. Y'all know the story. I just told you the story. They, build, they built the Baal, built their altars. And, and he said, here's the deal. Whatever God answers by fire is, is, is the real God, the Lord God. And so Baal's guys, they built their altar. They did all this stuff, went through all the routine. No answer. The heavens were shut up. Nothing, uh, and nothing happened. And, and then finally, in the, by the evening sacrifice, Elijah steps up, digs a ditch, fills it full of water, puts an altar of stone on it, and covers it with water again and covers it with water again and saturates it with water and then he stands back and he prays and he, then he calls on heaven and when he called on heaven we know the bible says the heavens opened up and fire came down and it licked up the altar it licked up the water it licked up the stones there was nothing left there was no doubt that the, that the god of elijah was the god that answered by fire some say today where is the god of elijah and then ravenhill says he still sits on the throne the problem is not the god of of Elijah. The problem is the Elijah of God. We need more men. We need more women that know how to call fire out of heaven. My point is this. We are getting ready to be released to a nation and we are getting ready to be released to a nation for one reason. Not so we can show them how acceptable we are, but so we can call fire out of heaven. And so we know the story. Then after all of that, they grabbed the, the prophets of Baal, took them down the mountain and executed them. And, and then we come here to this story that I need to preach on just for a few more minutes today. And we come to this story because after the supernatural showdown became a supernatural supplication. This, this is where Elijah told Ahab, I hear the sound of the abundance of rain. He went up, the Bible says, and he said, I hear the sound of the abundance of rain. Ahab, you better get your chariot. It said, and Abraham went up and he ate. He said, you better go eat. <laughs> I don't know what all that's about, but he went up and he ate. And he ate. He, he took the natural things of substance because that's what gives the, the, the uh, Ahab church its energy or the natural things. He ate and he drank. He ate and he drank. And we could just go ahead and put on there and was merry. He would have been merry, but all the prophets are dead. So he's not too merry right now. He's pretty sad. And so he went up and he ate and he drink and he continues to feed on the carnal things because that, that's all he has and he's taking it in and he's taking it in and then Elijah shows up again and said I hear the sound I hear the sound of the abundance of rain he told his servant go check it out and he said he went he climbed up and he went and he said there was nothing coming I don't see any sign of rain at all and the Bible says that Elijah put his face between his knees as he bowed down and he began to supplicate and he began to cry out because he was crying out for what he had heard. I had heard the sound of the abundance of rain. And so he went back again and again and again and again until the seventh time. And then the servant came back on the seventh time. And when he came back, Elijah said, is there anything out there? He said, yes, there is a cloud about the size of a man's hand. And Elijah, and then Elijah told Ahab, you better get your chariot ready. You better get ready to go because it's getting ready to rain. It's getting ready to rain. You see, I want you to understand this, that the praying until we see what we have heard is huge for, for where God is taking us. We can't afford to quit too soon. If he would have quit at six, uh, the number of man, it would have never happened. But he pressed beyond the flesh into the number of God's seven, that it might happen. Somewhere along the way, we're going to be tested, and God wants to know how deep will you go, and how long will you stay? I say we stay until we see the cloud.
What are you talking about? Because you see, after this supplication came a supernatural saturation. That, that was the heavy rain. Y'all remember the heavy rain? They said the sky grew dark, grew dark. And the clouds rolled in. And there was a heavy rain. And Elijah took off in the heavy rain. But this is where the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah. He girded himself. And this, this is what caught my attention. Because this is basically where I stopped under the heavy rain. And as the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and the hand of the Lord came upon him, accelerated, and he was a run rainer, a rain runner. What does that mean? That means we know how to function by the grace of God under realms of glory that we have never seen before. That we know how to experience and how to draw on the weight of God's glory. You see, church, there are things that just hasn't happened yet because the glory realm hasn't got thick enough yet. It's not a matter of not having enough faith. It's not a matter of not believing. It's not about not being hungry enough. I don't know where there is more hungry people than in this building right now on this planet. It's not about not being, it's not, I don't, I don't know more people that's got faith like the people in this room right now. It's not about hunger and it's not about faith. It's about pulling on the weight of God's glory until he gets so thick in this room that certain sicknesses will have to die and be healed. It's about getting the glory so thick that certain bondages won't be broken until then. But when you step into a level of weight and glory and presence and the grace of God is there for you to function in that moment that it can be things happen that our eyes will see but our minds cannot grasp. Yes. So the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah, and Elijah girded up himself, and he ran ahead. Everybody say, ahead. ahead. Ahead of Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. This is what caught my attention. Elijah ran ahead. Because Elijah was not only a rain runner, he was a forerunner. Forerunners go to places before other people are allowed to go there. See, after the, after the supernatural showdown, the supernatural supplication and the supernatural saturation was the supernatural showing up. Not a showing off. Okay, you got to get a picture. You got to get a picture. Ahab takes off in his chariot. But we know chariots are made for the rain. And that's why the Ahab church isn't going to flourish in the rain. It can't handle the rain because revival is messy. And it creates mud. And the chariots can't run in the mud. Remember that? Just ask, the, just ask the Egyptians that got stuck in the mud. They couldn't get out of the mire of revival. See, there are so many people that struggle with the messiness of revival because they want everything like they think is it, we got to keep it in order. We got to keep it controlled. But you got to understand sometimes it just gets a little crazy. When you have wild ones and you have weird ones, it just gets crazy sometimes. You got to understand this. So, so, so the Ahab church has said, no, we don't believe in that. No, we don't, we don't do that. No, we don't think that's biblical. But the Elijah church, prophetic in its nature and apostolic in its authority, will begin to speak things and say things and see things happen that nobody else will allow happen. There will be things that happen in this building that have never happened before. 
Somebody shout yes. yes. So Elijah, watch this. So Elijah runs ahead under the acceleration, under the spirit of God, and he's waiting. He's waiting for Ahab. He's waiting. He's sitting there waiting at the entrance. It's like. He's waiting. And the reason he is waiting is because he wants Ahab to know that we are meant to be here. He wanted him to know that he was meant to be here. Y'all ain't getting this. He wanted Ahab to know we're supposed to be here. We belong at the entrance. We belong at the gate. He's not showing off. It's a spiritual showing up. There's getting ready to be an Elijah church show up. It's going to run ahead of the Ahab church, and it's going to wonder what in the world is going on. How did they get from here to there so quickly? It's going to be because we're supposed to be there. You see, he wanted Ahab to know when you left here, things changed since you've been here last. Uh, when you came here last time, you were the big wheels. But now things have changed. Now things have changed. I own the entrance of the city. You don't own the entrance of the city anymore. I own the entrance of the city. He said, I belong here, and things are changing. Things are changing. Ahab, I want you to know the drought is over, and things are changing. I want you to know the drought is over. And oh, by the way, you can expect more rain like this. You can expect more rain like this. You can expect more rain like this. Please understand, we're not at the end of this thing. We're at the beginning of this thing. And you need to understand that we are at the beginning of a thing, and we we are not at the end of this move of God. We are at the beginning of this move of God. We are not at the end of this thing. There is a wave yet to come. See, rain makes rivers, and rivers make oceans, and oceans create waves. I'm telling you, there's getting ready to be a wave like tsunami type of the presence and the power of God that's getting ready to hit this nation. He said, it's going to keep raining, Ahab. See, forerunners enter new atmospheres first. There will be some that struggle with the atmosphere in this house because it is so unlike the atmosphere of theirs. But forerunners enter new atmospheres first. They're like storms. They're like fronts. There's always a clash between atmospheres. So what Elijah is doing, he's making a statement to Ahab. And the statement is this, is the atmosphere over this city shifted. It's not the way it was when you left. It's shifted. It's changed. The drought is over. You can expect more rain. It's never going to be like it was before. You see, I kind of prophesy over you and then I'm done today. And we need to understand what God has given to us and what God has done for us. And we need to understand that we are a chosen people. That God was raising up John the Baptist. And Gabriel prophesied over him and said he would be a forerunner. And he would run. And he would go before the people of God. And he would prepare, he would be a voice in the wilderness. And he would prepare a way for the manifestation of Jesus. He made a way. For the second coming of Jesus, that was his job. That was his anointing. He was a forerunner. He ran to get the people ready 
Jesus is coming. One greater than me is coming. John didn't do miracles, but Jesus did miracles. He said he's coming. He's a greater one. He paved the way. He went out before him. He spoke to a people, and he called them to repentance. He called them to turn. He called them under the power of Elijah that was with on him, and he ran. He was a forerunner. No one else understood what was going on. Nobody realized that the atmosphere was getting ready to shift over a planet. Nobody understood who Jesus was and what was going to happen when he was born. Nobody knew he would be a savior, a deliverer, and a healer, and a soon-coming king king but there was a manifestation of transition in that generation you see you have to understand God strategically has worked through what is called transitional generations the first generation was Moses when he established the old covenant God used Moses he was a forerunner and through signs and wonders and miracles in the working hand of God he brought a nation out of bondage and he brought them in to the to the covenant of God and brought them in to what we call the old covenant and then the second generation that we see biblically was the was the apostles and when God established a new covenant after Jesus Christ there was a transition there was a transition of power signs and wonders and miracles see you have to understand this and the third generation biblically we haven't seen yet actually I'm looking at them right now the third generation will be those that see the coming of the Lord will be those that understand Jesus is coming soon Jesus is coming soon I got this conviction he is coming very soon uh, I don't know when but I believe there's, there's the generation that will see the coming of the Lord is on this people planet right now they may be two they may be 20 I don't know but there is a generation of promise on this planet right now they have have a promise to see the Son of God with a sword in his hand, fire in his eyes, riding on a white horse to come and rule and reign over the nations. But I got good news. Before he comes to reign, he will come in revival. There's a people yet to be made ready. We have a job to do, church. We are forerunners for one of the greatest manifestations of God this earth has ever seen. Somebody shout yes. Think about it. Almost done. Think about it. This is the generation of the Lord's coming, the rapture, the second coming, the millennial reign of Christ, where he sets up his kingdom on this earth, and rules out of Jerusalem. That's literal, spiritual, before he comes for us, he's going to come to us. We are standing in a place of authority. See, God was saying over, over, over John the Baptist as he was prophesying through Gabriel and then his unbelieving father, Zacharias, who was a priest, his mouth was shut because he did not believe Gabriel. And Gabriel said, you will not speak until your son who will be named John is born. And once he was born, Zacharias' mouth was loosed. And he began to prophesy over his son. And he said, you are a forerunner. I'd come to prophesy over you and say, you are a forerunner. And we carry with us into this generation that is absorbed in idolatry, a word from heaven, a voice in the wilderness, a voice that is cry loud and spare not, a voice that will prepare a people for the coming of the Lord, not just the, 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 the literal coming, but the spiritual coming of revival. You've got to understand, whoa, God, help me preach this. We're heading into something that I have not seen, ear hath not heard, nor is it entered into the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for those that are passionate 
for him. You've got to understand something. What lies ahead is a voice. The church's voice is going to begin to be amplified in the midst of darkness, in the midst of chaos, in the midst of all kinds of weightiness. And there's stuff coming up on this planet, but that stuff is going to create a cry. The cry is going to go into the heavens, and one day the trumpet of the Lord shall sound. But the point I'm trying to release over us today is we need to understand that we need to activate our authority. Elijah, when he stood at the gate, when he stood at the entrance, he was activating his authority. He was taking his place. He said, no, 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 Ahab, your days are numbered. Jehu is rising up. Your days are numbered. Jezebel's days are numbered. No, no, no. Your, 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 your prophets are dead. It's a new day. It's a new season. It's time to rise up. Revival is coming to the land. And we need to now and understand that the Holy Spirit that is in us is waiting on us and is drawing us and is, well, he, he wants to rise up and as we activate that authority we will speak things on earth that will move things in heaven. We will speak things and angels will move. Demons will move. Human hearts will move toward God. You have a voice to be raised up. You are a forerunner because you're going to be declaring this is what is coming. This is what is coming. Today, church, the Holy Spirit is inviting us on a journey to make an impact in this generation. You're saying, oh, Pastor, you're getting dramatic. Did not James say that Elijah prayed, who is just like us? He said, did Elijah pray? He's just like us. He struggles with the things we struggle with. He has the same propensities we have. He has the same weaknesses we have. He has all of those things. That's Elijah. That's who he was. He wasn't anything special except God anointed him with power. God anointed his voice. God gave him a message. And he experienced something that nobody else knew about that was going on in the heavenlies. But he saw it. He said, I hear it. It's the sound of the abundance of rain. And there's a heavy rain getting ready to fall. I want you to know he was a forerunner. Before there was any rain, he was declaring there's rain. But I have come to tell you there is rain already falling but yet we're at the front end of the storm the storm is going to get greater the wave of God is going to crush idolatry everybody stand all over this building you see the only way to crush idolatry idolatry Is spiritual craving. You know, Jesus, our Bible says in Hebrews 6.20, was our forerunner. He says, he has gone before us. He has gone before us. Where did he go? Well, according to Hebrews 10, he created a new and living way by the blood that was shed. He made a way for us into the very glory, into the very manifested presence of God. Jesus was our forerunner. He went somewhere first. And nobody else could go there until he went first. God is calling us to go places no one else has ever gone first. This is why the way we worship matters. This is why the way we pray matters. Because we're going somewhere that no one else has ever been. This is why we have this insatiable cry for realms of glory.
A forerunner is a person that precedes the coming or the development of someone or something. As God continues to draw harvest into this house, we will have to continually lead the way on how to run in the heavy rain. How to respond in the heavy rain. They're going to need someone to follow. This is why we always exhort you about Revival Weekend. Do not miss. Why? Because we need you. Because when a region gathers, they don't know how to run in the rain because they've gotten used to living in the drought. We don't have to live in the drought. There's rain in this place. Rain in this place. The Lord had me hit that bail thing for some reason. You can't run in the rain. success be your God, sir. I didn't say you couldn't have success. It is what it is. But when it becomes the ultimate thing, it destroys marriages and families and wasted lives. The sexual thing that has a grip on our nation Does it have you, sir? Does it have you, ma'am? It needs to be broken today. That idol needs to be crushed over our nation and over the church. It's destroyed way too many lives. God's looking for a people who'll run in the rain. He's looking for a people that'll run ahead of the crowd. And say, I don't know what it's going to look like. I don't know what God has in front of us. I'm going to pull it down and I'm going to learn how to live in it. And you watch and see. You watch and see when God begins to raise up churches all over our city. He said, we're breaking free. We're breaking free. We're going to run in the rain. We're going to follow you. We're going to follow you. There's a forerunner anointing on your life today. That's why you're here. That's why you didn't get up and walk out. There's a forerunner anointing on you. morning I want to release that in great measure over your life I'm gonna I think I'll deal with it a little more next week on a, a different way vein but I'm gonna go deal more with John the Baptist but right now the first thing we have to do is we get to kill the spirit of, of idolatry over our life I just mentioned two things. There, there's a plethora of gods and idols throughout the Bible. 
But this is what we have to understand. Each one of them had a spirit behind it. Each one had a demonic spirit behind it, energizing it. Why else would Israel struggle? Why is it that they had a hard time walking away until the prophets showed up and until fire fell? Search your heart, man of God. Search your heart, woman of God. I know I did. I want it right. I want every idol crushed. I want to pursue you and you alone. I want to be able to call fire out of heaven. If you're ready this morning to crush every idol, if you're ready this morning to not only run in the rain, but go before the rain. If you're ready not just to get there yourself, but to take people with you, I need you to join me around in the front of this building right now because there's some things that are going to be broken off your life. Things maybe I didn't even mention is going to be broken off your life. I want you to begin to pray in the Holy Spirit right now. I believe this is a serious moment right now. I believe this is a big deal right now. Just like Elijah called Israel together, I'm calling you to the front of this building right now. And I said right here, right now, the God that answers by fire. May God answer you by fire today. May the fire of God come upon you right now. May the fire of God come upon you right now. May the fire of God come upon you right now. May the fire of God come upon you right now. May it burn up every idol. Lord, may there be no one and nothing between you and us. Lord, may there be no idolatry in this house. May there be nothing between us and be between us and you, O God. But we build an altar in this place and we give ourselves to you in this place, oh God. There are places throughout the Old Testament where it talks about different kings and how they did evil in the sight of the Lord and then some would do good in the sight of the Lord. And we we'll talk about those that said and they did good in the sight of the Lord, but they left 
the high places, the places of Baal worship and Asherah worship, they left them. See, as long as you leave it intact, it's way too easy to go back to it. There was a few in there. They said they went up to the high places and they tore them down. To take us into the realms of glory that we cry for, we're going to have to crush the high places. Places that don't even have the label of sin on them. They're just taking way too much space in our hearts that belong to Him. I want to crush them all. I'm not talking about yours. I'm talking about mine. You want to crush yours? I want to crush mine. I can't crush yours. You got to crush yours. Just lift your hands and surrender. We just surrender all to you, Jesus. We surrender every space, every area, every part. This morning, we give it all to you, Lord. We hold nothing back. For Lord, we do want the greater, the greater, the greater. We do want the greater glory, Lord. We do, we do, we do. We want you, we want you, oh God. All of you, so take all of us today, God. We give all of us to you that we might have all of you. Lord, we don't want, don't want to be. The same. We want to burn with your holy fire, your purity. God, burn. Help us, oh God, to have no other gods before you. But burn in our hearts, oh God. Let your holy fire burn in our hearts, oh God. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. We hold nothing back. Purify us, oh God. Set us ablaze. So I loose over you this forerunner anointing. And I say, may you run in the power of Elijah. May you be a voice in the wilderness, preparing the way for a people, making them ready for the coming of the Lord. Thank you for it, Father. In Jesus' name. And the church said, come on, give the Lord a praise in the house today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you for watching Fresh Start Church's YouTube channel. If you enjoyed this message, take a minute and click the subscribe button so you won't miss any of our videos. If you've been impacted by Fresh Start Church and want to partner with us to continue to reach others, you can text OFFERING to 623-299-2707 to give right now. Thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe.